Hey there, Matt here. Before we get started, just want to let you know that we will be sprinkling some book knowledge into our podcast. Don't worry, they will not spoil any aspect of the story. They're just more supplementary. However, if you're a person who absolutely hates book reader knowledge in your TV talk, then this podcast probably isn't for you. Also, we're sorry. Anyway, here's the podcast. Hope you enjoy. Dedicated to George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire book series. Foes and false friends are all around me, Lord Davos. They infest my city like roaches, and at night I feel them crawling over me. And the HBO Game of Thrones franchises. The North remembers, and the Mummer's farce is almost done. You're listening to Before the Dragon. Don't tell me what to do. Do, 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 do. Still do, your 52,300 and 42nd favorite podcast with the name House of the Dragon in it. Welcome back to Before the Dragon. How does it have House of the Dragon in it if it's named Before the Dragon, you ask? I don't know, but somehow it does. At any rate, thanks for joining me. My name is Matt. It's time for our later week podcast. Once again, our panel is not with us this week. I'm having to record these sporadically at all times of day and night because of my schedule this week. And I apologize for the fact that you don't get opinions that really matter. I can guarantee you that I have some of those panelists' opinions shared. They've actually, you know, sent me a a couple of things that I can read for them. So they won't be totally without voice in this particular podcast. But otherwise, it's just me vocalizing it. And you know how well that goes usually. So sorry about that. If you would like to contact us with any of your information regarding these episodes that we see i would appreciate if we hear from you in regards to that how do you do that you send tweets to at the letter b the number four the dragon pod on twitter you can send emails to matt's audio blog at gmail.com m-a-t-t-s audio blog at gmail.com you can leave comments on our website posts or you can use the contact form at the website and that website is mattsaudioblog.com, M-A-T-T-S, audioblog.com. You can also leave comments, of course, on our YouTube videos. Several people have. We'll be reading some of that later this week or later in the podcast regarding last week's feedback or this week's feedback. And you can simply search for the word before the Dragon Podcast to find the channel because I don't have a clever name that's easy to find. So just search for Before the Dragon podcast on youtube please subscribe please use that notification bell so that you're sure to get when the new videos come up and please comment there if you're using it we're trying to get that side of the whole podcast up with the visual stuff so that you get jokes and things like that in a more visual manner and you don't have to be bothered with it quite so much in the audio portion of the podcast uh if it's not your thing then uh, you know we don't we don't blame you for not subscribing to the YouTube. That's fine. But we would love to hear from you, no matter what kind of platform you're going across. We'd also love for you to share this podcast with your friends. We want our community to grow. We've only got one week left of House of the Dragon. We'll be back more often. I mean, it's going to be another two years before we get a new season of House of the Dragon, or close to two years, maybe more like a year and a half, if they really push the schedule. Which, given the success of this series, I think that they might. But at any rate, just get to us somehow. We'll be doing more content in the off season uh, when we can get everybody together. It's tough. We've got five different people with five different schedules living in five different places, and that makes it difficult sometimes to coordinate. Uh, I've been in awe this season of everybody's ability to pretty much coordinate their schedules so that we can record podcasts for you. I was the cog that broke. I had the, the one of the little teeth of the wheel broke this week with my own schedule. What I do want to do this time around is we will be talking about the music a great deal. Uh, it's, it's like a 25 minute segment. So if you're not into music, this might not be the podcast for you, but we are going to go over your feedback. We're going to go through the three words. We're going to go through the brothel mates, any of your general thoughts. And I've got a few little things that I would like to kind of rethink since my initial reaction. So let's start off with something that I obviously aired in in the initial reaction podcast. Although 
I err often, so I could spend a whole podcast just correcting my own errors. But I did want to point this out. When Sir Harold left, I wondered if he would return. And clearly, he's not going to get that chance because Allison made Kristen Cole the Lord Commander. I don't know how I missed that. Sorry. The one thing that I still don't quite understand, and really this is just fodder, but I don't understand why Sir Kristen Cole got such a huge speaking role at the ceremony itself. I wouldn't think that would be his place. I would have thought that the priest of the seven or whatever would have said all of that stuff, but oh well, I don't know. Also, speaking of Kristen Cole, when Allison was dispatching him to find Aegon, she said something that on a rewatch struck me as a little weird. She said, everything you feel for me, and then added as queen. And she did run it all together. But I, if you think about that, that just feels like some kind of code to me. So is there something happening between Alicent and Kristen Cole? Remember that Sir Kristen Cole was nowhere to be found when all that trouble at Driftmark broke out, the fight between Aegon and the Strongs and Bela and Reyna. So I ask, was he merely guarding the queen at that time? Or was he merely asleep? Or if he was asleep, was he sleeping alone? Now, I know that that is purely reckless speculation. Reckless speculation! Reckless speculation! But I just thought I'd put that out there. Another thing to rethink. Larry's and Otto. That whole communication between them after Lord Coswell was being taken away. As I thought about this later, the common benefit that Laris alluded to must have been the Masaria thing, right? And I'm, I'm not sure how I missed that in my initial reaction. And maybe Laris brings it up because he knows about Otto letting the network go on. And how does he know that? Well, that's kind of a mystery. If you want to buy into the whole warging thing, there's still lots of rats around. That may be how he knows, although the one meeting that we saw between Otto and the messenger for the White Worm earlier in the season when he found out about Rhaenyra and Damon, I didn't see any rats running around there. That doesn't mean that Laris couldn't have been warging into something else, if you believe any of that. Not everybody's convinced of that. Susan has kind of talked me down from that ledge a couple of times this season already. But in this episode, if Otto says he will remember, he said that in such a menacing way to Missaria that that has to be what Laris was alluding to. And then Laris, of course, could have just played the same to Allison just to get, you know, whatever pleasure it was that he was getting from the way that he deals information out to Allison. But because he told Allison about auto knowing about this first of all was that even true second of all well we know that it's true i guess that auto has let that and even used that information to gain an advantage but how would laris know that auto now no longer thinks that advantage is worth the trouble over the benefits again that's something about laris's own web that's going on there whatever that web is and as far as the fire goes, I think, looking at it a second time, that it definitely is Masaria's place. I have heard other suggestions on other podcasts that it might have been the place where the kids were fighting. But when I looked at that scenery again, it looked a little bit too opulent. And if I recall right, Eric and Eric, pardon me, Eric and Arik went into a place that was very crowded with buildings on either side this did not look like that place it did look much more like the place where we saw Talia approaching Masaria in a previous episode so I'm assuming that it is Masaria's place and I'm assuming that Laris did in fact have this done but the timing with the whole Allison thing was a little weird so maybe he was already putting that plan in place because Otto had approved it, but still getting his, you know, quote-unquote payment for it by going to Alicent. The other thing regarding this 
that I noticed was the guy with the hood on that was walking away. Obviously, he's the one that started the fire. But I thought, could this be one of Laris's guys that also helped set fire to Heron Hall? I mean, is arson a specialty in these days in Westeros? The thing that might rule that out would be the fact that the guys from Heron Hall, you would think would be just allowed to just go on about their business, to go wherever it is that they wanted to go to after the Heron Hall thing. But maybe Lara still has some kind of little thing over their heads or whatever where he can keep calling them back to do future services. But that's my thoughts on that. I also want to rethink Alicent herself just a little bit and why she is so at odds with her father in this episode. I think everyone else, even her son, sees that Viserys would never renounce his daughter to be the heir. Because of that, the council has been planning accordingly in secret. Meanwhile, Alicent, for whatever reason, truly believes that Viserys named Aegon the heir. And that's why she's striving so hard to present this peaceful way to kind of talk this out with Rhaenyra. And my point to bringing this up is the fact that after we reviewed episode 8, I had still stood firmly on the fact that I thought the whole idea of just getting back to the same place that we were with the Greens and the Blacks being at odds after having that beautiful dinner and then her hearing those words from Viserys at the end of episode 8 before he died... You know, I was really down on that. But when you see the way this particular episode plays out and how that motivates Alicent, which ends up even getting respect from Rainey's and as a result uh, saves all of them on the stage, I'm going to pull back on my take that the whole thing was a complete waste and say that that helped for making a beautiful episode this episode. So at the time... It seemed pointless to me, but now it seems really important. So I just wanted to take a new stand on some things that I had said last week. As I mentioned earlier, there's not much in the way of the usual podcast this week as far as, you know, we don't have any of our panelists here. But I just wanted to note that we did get some chiming in from a couple of our panelists via Twitter where John actually messaged our group and pointed out the following. He said that Viserys is now confirmed as a dreamer this week. His dream of seeing his son crowned with the crown of Aegon the Conqueror came to pass this week. I didn't even think about that, but that is true. Now, was this a self-fulfilling prophecy? Because he told Allison about the dream, right? So... She knew to set all of that up. So was it really Viserys's? I mean, it did come true. But the way prophecies work in this world sometimes make them self-fulfilling. And did Viserys make it self-fulfilling by sharing that dream with Alicent back at the hunt? Of course, if Viserys had not shared the dream with her, then we may never have heard of it. And therefore, we wouldn't care whether he was given Aegon's crown or not. But the most concrete evidence would have been if he hadn't told Alicent, but had told someone else. And then we would for sure know that Viserys was a dreamer. Not saying that he's not. I'm just saying that a lot of these dreams can be self-fulfilled, with the exception of Aegon the Conquerors, evidently, which we see play out a couple hundred years later. It was still an excellent catch by John, which I completely missed. Sticking with prophecy, Susan also sent in some stuff on our DM thread. The beast beneath the boards. Susan came up with this answer, that the beast beneath the boards was Rhaenyra's dragon. I guess you can consider Melee's a beast, and it did come up through the floor. That floor, to me, looked more like it was made out of stone. But I may be being a little bit too literal with the whole boards thing. Obviously, the boards can just mean the floor. So that would work out quite well. Susan also mentioned that I'm currently re-watching the episode, and one of the things that quite astonished me 
is the fact that they allowed Sir Harold Westerling to actually leave the small council room like that, especially after the standoff between Westerling and Cole over the death of Lord Beesbury. And Susan, I was a little bit astonished by that too, but then I just concluded, who's, who's going to challenge him? He still got his sword on him. All he did was turn over his cape. I suppose Kristen Cole would have been up for the job, but I don't know if he'd have been successful. So conveniently, they just let him walk. At the same time, he's able to, you know, now go out and tell the world that Kristen Cole is a murderer, although I don't know who will listen to him. Obviously, they have Aegon in place now, so I don't know what panned out with that. But I think the larger point that Susan is trying to make here, uh, she goes on with, I think we saw a number of examples of one of Martin's favorite dilemmas, honor versus duty. And it played out over lots of different pairs in this episode. Westerling versus Cole. Eric versus Arik. Amund versus Aegon. Alicent versus Otto. And Alicent versus Rhaenys. And the final little bit that I'm going to give you uh, for this week is just the results of our Seven Hells. We won't have any more Seven Hells drawings because the panel will be ne- back next week, but there won't be any more episodes. We're coming up on the season finale, so it would be kind of pointless to draw for the next season. Well, I don't guess it would be completely pointless, but it would be a long wait. As far as this episode goes, who everybody had drawn for last week, no punishments. Everybody escaped, and I really thought we would get some, either with uh, Alicent or Masaria or Otto, but none of it panned out. Everybody kept their mouths clean. Nobody said a dragon name. Alicent did refer to a dragon, but I do not believe that she said the name. And as a final result, everybody got punished this season, except Holly. Holly is one of those people who wins contests. She's part of the winning trivia team. She wins drawings all the time. So her usual luck kind of held up as far as all that goes, even when she was playing it rather loose. So congratulations to her for making it all season without being punished. The rest of us got punished. Stephanie does owe one. What's been happening with Stephanie is the fact that she has not been able to keep up with the show because of her schedule. So it's kind of pointless for her to come on a podcast, of course, if she hasn't even seen the episode. But we hope that she catches up as soon as her schedule clears or allows her to. And she'll be back, and she still has one punishment, an instant death, to pay. So she'll have to pick something out. And the next time that she appears, like in an off-season podcast or what have you, she'll have to pay it then. So those are the thoughts that I had in addition for this week. I know it's not nearly as in-depth as our usual panel podcast, because those people know what they're talking about. I just kind of steer the conversation and sometimes talk over people. But the one thing that I do do in these later in the week podcasts that people do listen to me for, and I usually sound halfway like I know what I'm talking about, is the music segments. And I loved almost all of the music in this particular episode so much good music, and I'm going to talk about just a few instances, not nearly as much as I would, wanted to, and still, this segment ended up being like 24, 25 minutes long, so you're going to want to skip ahead that much if you want to get to the three words, which will be after that, and you're a person who could care less about the music, but otherwise, stick around for the music segment, again, about 24, 25 minutes, somewhere in there, that's next. In my initial reaction, I had already pointed out the similarity of using piano in this episode as compared to the end of season six of Game of Thrones. But please don't misconstrue that for me to say that I'm doing a one-to-one of Alicent and Cersei. That's not what I mean at all. I'm just pointing out that in the season six episode, the piano was used in a situation where there was a change in power there was a shift in power this high sparrow was getting blown up cersei was more free to be cersei and in this episode there is also a shift in power in terms of whether aegon 
or Rhaenyra will be declared the new ruler. And that's the only kind of real similarity that there is here. I don't think it's about character so much. And I don't even know if it was intentional that Ramin used the piano here to represent that. I don't want to do a one-to-one of the piano with a representation of shift in power either, even though when we first heard it, the piano used in episode one, we can also point to the fact that as Viserys is telling Rhaenyra about the prophecy, that's when we start to hear the piano as well. And learning about this prophecy that, you know, Aegon the Conqueror's dream, that's a shift in power too. When Rhaenyra didn't have that, she didn't have near as much of a purpose to become the ruler. After she learns that, then she's much more willing to become the ruler. So the piano may represent a shift in power in all of the Game of Thrones universe, or it may not. But it's just interesting to find it being used in similar situations. And we'll go to the first part of the episode where Talia learns of Viserys' death that also accompanies the boys' walk through the castle. It's a version of Viserys' tragic theme. And of course, the big orchestration of it in episode 8 had a great amount of power to it. So here, the piano kind of quietly states the same but it adds a sense of sadness because it is a lone instrument playing this theme. But it also gets its own very heavy weight to it because what Ramin does is he adds a pedal point. What a pedal point is, is a fixed note at the bottom of the harmony that holds the center of pitch, no matter what kind of chords are being played on top of it or whether any chords are being played on top of it. So it sounds like this. And what the pedal point helps to do is add finality to all of this, that no matter what else happens, either in the story or in the harmony, this is the end, the end of Viserys, the end of the peace between the greens and the blacks. And the way that Ramin demonstrates this is he does in the second phrase, start to add harmonies to the melody but he still keeps that repeating bass note to give you that finality. He gives you that pedal point that says, no matter what you try, no matter what you do, the guy is dead. Here comes war. So you get the chords that say there's still story here to tell, but no matter what, again, Viserys is dead. Now, the piano continues throughout the rest of that scene, right up to where the council is meeting. It kind of develops and flows much in the way that Viserys' melody does. And then, after the council meeting, it is used again to introduce a motive, which means a snippet of repeated notes that tend to build an overall theme. And that motive that we, we have heard before. When we originally heard it, I had thought that it was part of a theme for Laris because it was when he was describing Harrenhal and everything. As it turns out, it's much more about the high towers. It's just showing the darker side of them because continually throughout this episode, we hear the motif that I'm talking about that we heard in episode six, again, as Laris was talking to Allison. It is coupled with the high tower theme in kind of a question answer kind of way. Uh, we call that a call and response. So this time, when Allison and Otto begin the search for Aegon, it carries all the way through, this motive does, through to the point where 
Rainey's and all of the other staff are being locked up either in the rooms or in the cells. And the truth of the matter is, is that I did hear a little bit of the Hightower theme in that episode. I just didn't realize I was hearing it because it was placed kind of weirdly and in just very sporadic spots during the aftermath of Heron Hall. So the evidence has been there the entire time that this is just kind of like the part B of the high tower theme, the dark side of the high tower theme, but it definitely is part of the overall high tower theme. Now, when we first hear this motif in this particular episode, it's when Allison is actually telling Otto about Viserys and what she, well, you know, thinks that she heard. It's still rooted very much in the same key as the Viserys piece. But it's at the point we hear it where you understand that Otto is starting to plot as well. Just want to play that motive for you in the key that it's in there because it's used a lot, but it's used in a lot different keys throughout the course of the episode. It sounds like this. And not that it really matters whether a piece is in the same key all of the time or not. Often you'll hear the same melody being played in different key centers, different pitches, different keys is what we call that. But the next time that we actually hear this motive, it is interwoven with the high tower theme again in that kind of call and response kind of situation where it seems like one is answering the other. And this time the theme is placed in the original key that we heard the Hightower theme in back in episode five when Allison made her entrance. And I love the way that these two snippets kind of talk to each other musically. One says part of it, the other one responds. It sounds like this. But by the time that Otto's machinations are starting to happen, where people are being withheld so that they can't tell the news of the king dying and what have you, uh, that's when that motive starts to take center stage. It actually takes center stage right when Rhaenyra is realizing that she's her door has been locked. And it's wonderful. There's this wonderful harmony that's placed underneath it to make it build, to help to build our anticipation for what's going to happen. We worry a little bit about Rainey's because of this. We worry uh, about the entirety of the whole kingdom, maybe even the people in the cells, although I don't know how much anybody really likes Talia other than the fact that she's Sapochnik's wife, I guess the actress is. I don't have anything against Talia. I'm just kidding. Uh, but really, when everybody's getting herded in the cells and Rainey sees what's going on and realizes she can't get out of her room, that's when the motive completely takes over. You don't hear any more of the high tower theme. And again, the harmony helps to build our anxiety a little bit because it centers around notes that don't really fit. So that covers that particular motive, which is the darker side of the high tower theme. But let's go back and concentrate on the main part of the high tower theme itself, since it does play a big part in this episode, which you would naturally think musically it will, because this is the green council. This is the basically the high tower camp that we're talking about. And so you have the high tower theme used a lot. I just want to refresh your memory because you may have recognized it in some of those snippets that I played before, but I just want to play the main part of the melody all by itself so that you can recognize it uh, throughout the course of the episode the next time that you watch it. The main melody sounds like this. Okay, so now hopefully you have that in your head. Now listen to the music as Viserys' body is being prepared. That melody is there. 
Listen to when Aegon actually starts walking through the soldier archways as he's doing his procession towards where he will be uh, anointed king. Both times, the melody is there. But if you'll notice, if you watch those scenes back to back, you can recognize the melody. But the feeling of the scene is completely different, right? How is that possible? If it's the same melody and really most of the same harmonies are implied, how can it possibly be that we feel different emotions between the Alicent scene and the Aegon scene? Well, here the difference is timbre, meaning the instruments that are used to play these, and somewhat also the kind of ambiance that is created by the recording that tends to lend to our feelings as well. I'll get to that in a minute, but I want to concentrate on how the difference in timbres are used. If you think back to episode five and Allison's glorious entrance into Rhaenyra and Lenore's wedding, what instruments were playing the melody at that point? Primarily strings. So strings represented her, yet in the Aegon procession, when he's coming towards being an anointed or what have you, then what we get is mostly brass. For some reason, a long time ago, and I don't know when, and I don't know how, but for some reason in our Western society, we have begun to associate brass with power, with nobility, with royalty. At the same time, we've attached different kinds of emotions to strings. Strings typically represent sadness or warmness, but more on the emotional side of things. And they also tend to represent a sophistication. And I think both of these timbral instances represent the difference in the music here as well. For Aegon, we're naturally getting brass. This is an official proclamation of Aegon being king. He is being anointed. He is now king. This is official. This is noble. And that's why you have, uh, you know, all of the brass. If you've ever heard the phrase, the heralding of trumpets, this is exactly it applies because for whatever reason, sometime back in our history, uh, maybe because the instruments were easier to make because they were just straight and they didn't require a whole lot. As long as you had the right tubing length, you could actually, uh, you know, and could produce the sound. You could play those instruments quite well. And so it was easy to use that to herald in the king. I don't know how long that's been going on. It may have been thousands of years uh, ever since they invented any even shell horns or whatever that they've been doing this kind of thing. But it's embedded deep within especially our Western culture. And like I said, I don't, I don't know how they, who made these rules or how, or whatever. I just know that that's what these colors mean to us. Uh, these timbers, timbers. One thing that's interesting to note is that if you look back at that episode five entrance of Allison, the first time it's progressed through, it's purely strings. And then a little bit of brass is added to it in order to give it even more power as she kind of approaches, gets closer to the stage there, closer to the throne. Now, the interesting thing here is we have an exact juxtaposition of that with Aegon. With Aegon, it is more of a case of, it starts off brass, official and everything. And then as he gets closer to his mother on the stage, you hear the strings come in. So it's like they're coming from two opposite directions, but they're kind of meeting in the middle the two different arrangements are. And I think that that's a beautiful thing because in the case of Alicent in episode five, she is gaining power through her entrance. And hence, we associate the brass with power. In this case, Aegon is looking to his mother for support and hence the strings, his mother. Uh, it's just absolutely brilliant. And I'm not really going to play these I'm just going to talk about them, but I want to go back to the scene with Alicent with Viserys' body. And I want to talk about not just the fact that a solo string is used, because he's done that a lot. He also, he often uses like a solo cello um, to represent sad things. And we definitely get a sad feeling. Uh, cello has this wonderful power of really emoting 
uh, by the way, the fact that it doesn't have any frets on it, so you can slide in between pitches, and that creates this effect of unsteadiness, which is often associated with sadness. So that was great. The other thing that happens, though, particularly in this scene, is something that we've heard actually used with Daenerys in season one of Game of Thrones, well, many seasons of Game of Thrones. There is this kind of feeling of environment that the instrument is in that is created through the soundscape. This is usually generated either by the composer because they add certain kinds of different kinds of effects to the instruments or he just using some kind of pad instrument that feels like uh, it's a little bit ethereal. In this case, I have to tell you, I have to admit that there is no way that I could possibly tell you how Ramin or his sound engineer are creating this effect. But what it does is it creates this effect that part of the instrumentation feels further away more in the background. And it's not just about mixing. It's about a combination of mixing and effects. It's a way of giving depth to the music. That's really interesting. And even the cello sounds like it's in this kind of weird space when you hear this. And I think that that is absolutely magnificent. It would take me hours and hours and hours of just trial and error with effects and different kind of mixing techniques and whatever to discover exactly how this might be created. And still, I would probably only come up with a slight approximation. A lot of times, especially recording engineers and musicians too, uh, composers as well, they take these secrets to the grave with them because it's part of their quote unquote sound. And what they do is, you know, they don't tell anybody how they're doing it. It's just these two guys get together and they go, Hey, you know that one thing? And he goes, yeah, I know that one thing. Can we do that one thing? And there it happens. So I'm not going to try to explain exactly how it does, but I do want to emphasize the fact that it does create a sense of depth towards the back of what you're watching. Like the instrumentation is coming from somewhere else. And I guess, depending on how sophisticated your sound system is or not, you probably might get this effect more or less one way or the other. I would actually suspect that a sophisticated sound system would probably hit you less with this. Uh, whereas if you're just dealing with a stereo sound, it probably feels more in depth. And I can't explain even how that works. All I can do is tell you that it just makes everything feel like it's further away. And in addition to that, it makes it feel hollow. And that is exactly what Alicent is feeling in that moment. It was a beautiful rendition of the theme, but more importantly, it was emotionally impact because of the timbre of the soundscape itself. And that just totally got me this time around. I loved it. Now, finally, I want to talk about the excellent use of the King's arrival theme this week. I'm going to say it again. I know I keep saying this, but don't call it the Baratheon theme. Just don't do that anymore. It's been used in the Game of Thrones universe now for five different kings or five different potential kings, uh, four of which made it, one of which uh, re never made it. That was Jon Snow. But I just love the way that Ramin has converted this to just represent the position of the king over the course of the years. I mean, I know Dave and Dan told you uh, that it was a Baratheon theme. And so everybody's taking that as gold. But if you're not going to take the ending that they put on screen in season eight gold, how can you take this as gold? I mean, you can't have it one way or the other. Well, I suppose you can. We are in kind of a world where we can be more complex than just black and white, right? At any rate, I'll get off of that soapbox. All I want to do is tell you that there were two distinct and unique versions of that theme. Uh, one was of one part of the theme, and the other one was of the second part of the theme. Now, the first part is kind of like the intro, the dun, da 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 and that was actually done by that trio of horns that were when Aegon was being announced, when he was being proclaimed. Again, brass, heraldry, nobility, and I love that they just played a little snippet of the melody. It sounded like this.
But the thing that interests me most about the use of the King's Arrival this time around was that the second part of the melody was played after Aegon was confirmed as king or brought up as king. And he starts to get applause from the audience and he raises his sword, Blackfire, into the air. There's all kinds of strange perversions of the theme in this particular case. It's almost like Ramin is trying to convince you if you are team green, that you shouldn't be team green because the harmonies that he's using are very uncomfortable in that moment. And this is again, before uh, Rainey's uh, arises with Melis in coming up through the floor and whatever, this is just with the crowd is behind him. He raises black fire and there are all kinds of powerful harmonies happening. You'll hear when I play this on the piano, and this is what I'm going to leave you with. We're going to do uh, three words next, but you will hear how different this sounds as compared to even the darkest versions that we heard in Game of Thrones as far as Joffrey Baratheon goes. That's where we tended to hear the most of them. This one just feels off kilter. It feels really not just weird, but a little bit scary. And I think that was the purpose of doing it this way was Ramin uh, is obviously Team Black. He doesn't want you to think that Aegon is going to be a worthy king, or he at least wants you to think that the way that he was made king uh, was not the correct way to do it. And that's probably the most important part right there. So I'm going to play this for you. Listen to the way the bass line drops. Again, a sinking feeling. Uh, that happened also in Alicent's uh, being with Viserys. The harmony was changed just slightly to create a sinking feeling, not nearly as scary. In that case, it indicated more of a feeling of sadness. But you can use the same kind of techniques, especially when you add what we call dissonance, which is two notes that wouldn't normally go together with a particular chord or two notes that would nor normally fit in a key or a single note that won't fit in a key. And we get a lot of that in the version of this presentation of the melody of the King's Arrival. It's changed just a little bit rhythmically as well. And another thing that is done is it's played much slower than we're used to hearing it. Most of the time we've heard it slow before, but not this deliberately where it just feels hesitant in a lot of ways. And again, I think that's Ramin trying to convince you to say that, Hey, team green, this is great. We're happy for you, but don't you just feel a little hesitant about the way that this all went down and by slowing the tempo down, he actually time wise and physically represents hesitancy maybe even hesitancy in Aegon himself because this is a position that he never wanted although he seems to be kind of into it at the moment that this happens but I'm going to leave you with this version of the king's arrival three words is next That's where you try to describe the episode in three words. Usually I don't uh, like so much just having three different adjectives. I like for you to try to make it into some kind of little catchphrase, but you submit whatever three words you want, really. As long as I can say them on a clean podcast, then I will repeat them. My three words this week were conflict of character. As I explained in my initial reaction, just too much in the way of extreme within the same character, within a very small time frame that made me come away not really understanding where I was supposed to stand on these characters. And I'm not saying it has to be black and white. I understand that these characters are complicated and everything like that. I just don't quite think that I should be jerked around quite that much. We got some other submissions via Twitter. Samantha739, who was our winner 
of our Scenes from a Westerosi movie. I've been in contact with her. She's already gotten a couple of her things already. I think we still got a couple more coming to her. But her three words, a missed opportunity. And then adds, Rainey should have said Dracarys. Yes, well, that certainly would have prevented everything that's about to come. I saw a lot of comparisons on the internet asking whether Daenerys would have done the Dracarys thing since Rhaenys didn't. Don't really like to kind of do those kinds of things. Rhaenys' situation wasn't really anything in comparison at all to Daenerys' situation. To you people on the internet who are making those comparisons or making those accusations as to whether Daenerys would do it or wouldn't do it, have fun with that, but I'm not going to play. On the other hand, Samantha, I totally agree. You're absolutely right. It would have just taken care of everything. And wasn't it even Otto's words this episode, sacrifice the few to save the many? Very much Tywin Lannister-like as well in his justification for the Red Wedding. One of our panelists, Susan, who is at Black Eye Lily on Twitter, submitted three, three words, Beast equals melees. And as we had heard her point out before, she believes the beast beneath the boards was indeed melees. Now, I guess I kind of spoiled her three words earlier when I talked about it, but I appreciated her bringing that to my attention because I honestly hadn't thought about that. Seems the most obvious thing, right? But no. I hadn't thought of it. Here's three words from someone who did not like the episode. Denise Arabella, once again, whose three words were terrible, wasteful, pointless. Wow. Uh, And gave these reasons. Did not like episode nine at all. Spent far too much time on transition politics that could have been resolved in 10 minutes. HBO should have cut 40 minutes out of this episode. A beautiful streak of great eps crashed and burned at episode 9. Total waste. Wow. Um, okay. I, I mean, you're more than entitled to your opinion. I disagree with that opinion. But, you know, it's just my opinion against yours. And as far as that goes, yours is probably better. That's usually the way these things go. My opinions are usually worse than everybody else's, but I really like the episode. And via YouTube, regarding this episode, we got some from our friend Nicole, who was also one of our contestants in the Westerosi movie contest. Nightwolf Nim on YouTube says three words, foot fetish fiend, and then adds a triple F. Yes, it is a triple F, uh, especially if you're part of the Joffrey of Podcasts listeners. Uh, The Double P Media Network, our friends over there, they like to do doubles and triples. And I think I even heard a septuple one time coming from Catfish, but I'm not sure that that was about Game of Thrones. I think that might have been about some other show. At any rate, Nicole adds, Laris is disgusting, not because of the fetish itself, but how he used it in an information power play. Very true. And that's all we have in three words, unless I missed yours. And if I did, I apologize. This is a very helter-skelter week for me. I'm doing all kinds of things out of order. And so if I missed yours, I really apologize. Please let me know. How do you let me know? You can tweet to at the letter B, the number four, the dragon pod on Twitter. You can send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com. You can leave comments at the website, mattsaudioblog.com, or you can leave comments in the YouTube, as Nicole did, left one on my initial reaction video. To find the channel, search for the word before, The Dragon Podcast. Brothelmates of the Week is next. Brothelmates is where you try to come up with the best coupling for the episode. It doesn't have to be two people. It can be a person and a concept. You're going to see lots of variances in the responses that we got feedback-wise this week. I think I misspoke, actually, on Sunday when I said Alicent and Rhaenyra. I actually meant Alicent and Rainies as my brothelmates for this week. 
because I really loved that scene between them. And I felt like that that scene was the moment in time when Rainey's had decided she wasn't going to act against what Allison was doing. She wasn't necessarily going to stand for it either. But that's why she didn't Dracarys, Allison, and the whole troop, really, when she had the opportunity, as Samantha suggested that she should. And I kind of think that she should have also. But I come away from this episode actually respecting Rainey's more because she didn't. Especially when you have people like Otto in this series and Tywin in the Game of Thrones series justifying murder by saying, kill the few to save the many. While it is excellent logic, it still just seems wrong. We have other submissions. Susan, our panelist at Black Eyed Lily on Twitter, says honor and duty and the tension in between them. And she kind of mentioned earlier when I was reading her comments near the beginning of the podcast how that's one of George R. Martin's favorite tensions and cited a whole bunch of instances within this episode itself. So it makes perfect sense. So I guess in a way, by reading her stuff up front, I spoiled both her three words and her brothel mate. Sorry about that, Susan. And finally, on YouTube, Night Wolf Nim. Again, that's Nicole. Her brothel mates were Lord Beesbury and Honor. And she adds, rest in peace. He deserved a better send-off. That death was kind of weird, wasn't it? I mean, it was played off more like an accident or whatever. Kristen Cole kind of just was attempting to push him in his seat and he kind of went forward and, you know, now we know why those balls have been there all season long. Just so it can be the perfect object to lodge into somebody's brain, be it accident or not. There typically have been some complaints about how unceremonious Lord Beesbury's death was. I kind of found it refreshing that it was kind of just normal. Well, not normal, so to speak. I mean, nobody gets a ball lodged in their head very often. But what I mean is I kind of enjoy the fact that there are unceremonious deaths because that's the way a lot of deaths happen, folks. Anyway, it probably would be best if I just stop digging myself into a hole and get to the feedback. Oi, can we get the feedback out of the monitors, please? So in feedback, Susan once again sends some thoughts to us, saying, My last thoughts are about Allison primarily. I was glad to see her confronting her father about how much he has manipulated her for his and or the entire Hightower family own ends. Her recognition that their hearts have never been as one was such a strong statement of her seeing her father more clearly and declaring her own agency in her actions going forward. I also loved her response to his pushback about his actions had made her queen. And how would she not have wanted that? To which she is responding that she couldn't know, having always followed his plans and directives. Of course, the irony in all of this is how she is repeating the same pattern with Aegon, and the hypocrisy of her high moral standards while having her sordid arrangement with Larry's. With how she can call for nonviolence and show a distaste for murder, but assent to Larry's removing threats he has identified in what she has to realize is going to be murder. Which, in the end, gets back to the point you were making in your initial reaction, Matt, that the episode tended to show people being such hypocrites that it was hard to be tr truly sympathetic for them if that's what they were attempting to do in the episode. Thank you, Susan, uh, for agreeing with me on that. I mean, I probably have taken it a step further. It's just like, I don't know what to think of these people. I mean, to me, it's just a wash. But thanks again for your thoughts, Susan. We have an old friend sending an email to us this week in response to our Season 1, Episode 8 podcast. This is Jerry, who's been listening for a long time. Jerry starts with, Hi, Matt. Thanks to both you and your podcast partners for such interesting and entertaining content about this engaging series. Just wanted to lightly weigh in on the cognizance level of the dangers, particularly regarding the children of Alicent and Rhaenyra. There were a plethora of good points discussed about both these former friends, recognition 
influence in and protective stances of their progeny. My perspective of Allison lends on a highly skewed fear of preemptive retribution, highly influenced by power-hungry whisperers in her ear. Although these perceived threats may have historical and or sociological potential, the actions and rhetoric displayed by her rival, Rhaenyra, don't tend to indicate that she would definitely proceed in that manner. Now, Damon's addition to that equation may alter those odds, but I still have my doubts. He has more familial devotion than I would have foreseen. However, Rhaenyra seems to be much more accurately aware of the true dangers to her children. As discussed in the pod's discussion, both her plea to Viserys to reinforce her and her children's succession status and her marriage alliance proposals, strong sons, and more directly Damon's strength, reflect Rhaenyra's recognition of the dangers surrounding her progeny. But I would add one more absolutely definitive action that displayed awareness. Rhaenyra left court with Laenor and family. She knew this was a potentially dangerous move, but the most effective physical protection gambit at the time. And she still recognizes it as she directs her sons to return to Dragonstone, while conceding that she will return to the Red Keep to attempt her reunification with Allison. Although I've not read the book, like most viewers, I know that The Dance is on the horizon soon. So, I'm aware that it appears that none of Rhaenyra's political maneuvering is likely to pay off in a positive conclusion. However, I do think that the entirety of her actions have displayed gravitas, not greed. To me, this imbues her with more of a dedication to principle, not power. Just my perspective. Best as always, Jerry. Thanks for those wonderful thoughts, Jerry. I think that you're completely right. I wonder how you feel about Alicent right now, because it seems like Alicent, though being preemptive, is also making the effort to not have the same thing happen to Rhaenyra and her children as she feared that Rhaenyra might do to hers. We've got a lot of YouTube comments as well. I'll start with Nicole Nightwolf Nim regarding this episode. I like the episode, but it's definitely the weakest of the season and the first time that a penultimate episode has felt underwhelming in this world. Some of the stuff even felt like filler. The whole search for Aegon just seems pointless and forced drama between Otto and Alicent. And while Masaria had a great moment, it also felt random and forced. I also hated how Lord Beesbury was killed. It was so abrupt and ridiculous how it went down. All that aside, I love the coronation and the ending with Rainey's. Okay, so uh, I mentioned this just a few minutes ago regarding uh, there's lots of people who share your opinion about the Lord Beesbury death, Nicole, and I can certainly understand that viewpoint completely. I guess I just found it refreshing about how random it was. I was a little miffed that it wasn't carried out as a murder, per se that it seemed a little bit more like an accident. But as far as accidents go, it seemed pretty realistic to me. And I'll be honest, you know, outside of this moment where Beesbury's standing up, I've paid him little to no attention this entire series. But that's just me. So, folks, I know you're going to send your hate mail to me now. Uh, do so by tweeting at the letter B, the number four, the Dragon Pod on Twitter. You can send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com, M-A-T-T-S audioblog at gmail.com. Leave a comment on the website, leave a comment on the YouTube videos, as Nicole does every week. Nicole, thank you so much for watching the videos and for commenting. We really appreciate it. Moving to YouTube comments from last week's podcast, Dragon Den, uh, it's spelled D-R-E-H. G-O-N, uh, so I don't know if that's supposed to be Dragon, Dragon Den or Dragon Den or Dragon Den, but anyway, I love the name. So, uh, thank you so much for your comments here. These were in response to our panel podcast last week. Damon smiled while Eamon was trying to look intimidating. When Eamon walked past, Damon looked at Rhaenyra like, can you believe this kid? Okay, thanks Dragon Den, that's kind of 
Uh, the impression I was getting from everybody else in the podcast last week, I thought that he was just a little bit scared. Maybe not. Dragon also adds, something just occurred to me. If Damon was the crown prince of Dragonstone, why didn't he have a sworn king's guard or two? Isn't that unusual? And to that I would respond, yes, that seems very unusual. Was one appointed to him by Viserys or maybe because Viserys always saw Damon as being tougher than him, then he was reluctant to give him one? Or perhaps Damon refused one. There's lots of reasons why Damon might not have one. I wouldn't want a king's guard following me around all the time when I do the kind of dastardly things like kill my first wife that Damon sometimes does. And who knows what he was up to before Viserys banned him from the kingdom and took away his airship, I guess you would say. Although I will say that because Damon started the gold cloaks, I don't feel like he really needed a king's guard. I felt like he had a pretty secure spot for himself with the gold cloaks kind of at his back. So perhaps that's the reason why he decided he didn't want any king's guard with him. But good questions, good thoughts. Folks, if you have any answers for Dragon Din, then please feel free to comment on his comment on the YouTube, or you can send them in here and respond in that way. We'll be the carrier of a two-way conversation. And then we've got these responses from Batman Panther on our Season 1, Episode 8 podcast, who wasn't very happy with the way we were handling some of the material, evidently. Batman Panther says, Rhaenyra's kids are biologically Targaryen. They are true-born children. The discourse around Rhaenyra's kids annoys me so much. Rhaenyra is the heir. She is a true-born Targaryen. Her kid are her kids. Targaryen blood flows through their veins. They are as much Targaryens as Aegon and Aemon. It's Aegon versus Rhaenyra, not Aegon versus Rhaenyra's kids. The lady in the podcast said that Rhaenyra's kids aren't true-born kids. What are we even talking about here? Rhaenyra is Viserys heirs, not her kids. Pooping on the podcast. Yeah. Actually, I can understand you being a little annoyed, Batman Panther. I think that Holly, I went back and checked it. I think that Holly actually just misspoke. But the point that she was trying to make holds true. The only reason that Rhaenyra is the heir is because Viserys made her so. Just like he took that airship away from Daemon, he could also do with Rhaenyra and award it to his son Aegon. Now, why did Viserys stop making Daemon his heir? Simply because of the comment that he made after his son died and his wife died. That's why he disowned Daemon. So, if you find out that your daughter is not capable of having a good marriage or anything, you have a perfectly good reason to disown her as the heir as well. Those things, whether the kids are the heir to the throne or not, and whether the fact that these are bastards or not, is intertwined, no matter how you look at it. But thanks for pooping on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Also, a shout out to Ray Sullins, who stopped by and left a comment on the YouTube channel, I think basically to promote his own channel, but saying that he was restarting up his channel. So, Ray Sullins, thank you so much for commenting and saying hello, and good luck with your resumed channel. And that's it for the written feedback. But I have a special treat for you folks. Kelly went to a great deal of trouble, made this video, and then the video didn't work, and then she remade the video, and the remake of the video was just a little bit longer than I could include in this particular podcast this time around because I spent so much time talking about the music. So you miss out on her thoughts this time. But in just a little bit, a part two will come out with Kelly's video. It'll just be her. I won't be interrupting her. I won't be putting her down. I won't be saying stupid things. Instead, you just get pure Kelly thoughts. And likely, now that she is doing videos on her own, she will likely take Holly and John and Stephanie and Susan away from me and start her own podcast network, the same way that Bubba did it to me 10 years ago when he said, enough of this Murdoch guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to go start my own podcast network. I'm sure the Kelly's Dragons podcast network will be coming soon. And I couldn't be happier to present to you her entire video 
in the next episode, which again, will be coming out shortly. As for this podcast, if you want to rub it in how much better her video is than mine, feel free to do so. Send tweets to at the letter B, the number four, the dragon pod on Twitter. You can send emails to Matt's audio blog at gmail.com. That's M A T T S audio blog at gmail.com. You can leave comments on the website or use the contact form at the website. That is Matt's audio blog.com M A T T S audio blog.com. Or you can of course leave comments on our videos, even her video. When it comes out in just a little bit, you can leave comments there too. We would love it if you would do so. Search for the word before and then the Dragon Podcast on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. Ding that bell so that you get notifications when new videos come out. Because even though this season is coming to a close, I promise you we're going to do more podcasts in the interim of seasons. Plus, who knows what other new shows may be coming out between the end of this season and the beginning of the next season of House of the Dragon. Please share the podcast with your friends. Or as far as my initial reaction podcasts go, if you really want to punish them, feel free to share the podcast with your enemies as well and help us jumpstart our algorithm once again by hitting that subscribe button. Remember, you can't unsubscribe in anger unless you are already subscribed. So you have to subscribe first. Hit that subscribe button, then hit the unsubscribe if you want, and then do it all again. Do it as many times as you want. Also, wherever you can, please leave us written reviews. That also helps the algorithm a little bit. Probably not as much as subscriptions, but I can't keep track of what the algorithms are keeping track of anymore because machines are just running our world. I can't even look at my Instagram account, which I'm not going to tell you what that is, but I can't even look at my Instagram account without getting about three suggested posts for every single post of a person that I'm actually following that I get. So all I'm asking is that you help us Help the machines to think for you. Well, not for you, but for everybody else. I've rambled enough. Kelly's video coming out soon. Take care.